What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. My name is Scott Barron. I'm here with Tori McElhaney and Ashton Edmonds. And Falcons Final Whistle has resumed its status as a post-game podcast. We are coming to you after a difficult loss for the Atlanta Falcons. The New Orleans Saints won 27-26. to It was a nail-biter. It was a dramatic finish. It was not a result that the Falcons were ultimately, ultimately looking for after really controlling both lines of scrimmage and the tempo for three-plus quarters. The New Orleans Saints ended up erasing a two-score, 16-point lead in the fourth quarter, and we're going to get into that a little bit and then really try to see um, where the positives were from this one and what the Falcons do from here, how, you know, like how they advanced on what is a long road trip. Mm-hmm. They're going to go to Los Angeles to play the Rams, and then they won't come home. And they're going to fly straight to the state of Washington to play the Seahawks. So that kind of sets the stage for everything that you're going to hear about o- over the next 20-ish minutes or something like that. My filibuster is now over, <laughs> and I will pose a question to you both. Um, what went wrong in that fourth quarter? Where did things get out of hand for for Atlanta when it seemed like they were in such firm control over the first three periods yeah for me it kind of lies in what we saw Jameis Winston and the Saints skill players do in terms of stringing explosive plays together after the game I really looked at those explosive plays because at the end of the day in the first three quarters Jameis Winston had less than 60 passing yards in the fourth quarter alone, it was over 200. Oh, my gosh. That's that, crazy. That number to me is wild. And then you break it down even further, and I was looking at, okay, how many plays did they have over 15 yards a pop? Seven. They had seven over 15 yards a pop. Four of those over 200 yards that Jamin Winston threw for, 174 came off of those seven plays alone. I'm not saying that this is – the reason the Falcons lost because we could go and say the opposite for the, the Falcons offense. They didn't do anything in the red zone in the fourth quarter when they absolutely needed to, to hold off what the saints were doing offensively. This whole thing, this whole game and, and the collapse that we saw in the fourth quarter, it's on both the offense and the defense. And to me, it's the explosive plays. It's not producing in the red zone. It's all of these things that I feel like we're talking about that didn't happen in the first three quarters, that you're excited about what the Falcons did in the first three quarters. And then to go a complete 180 in the fourth quarter, it's really a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Ashton, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I definitely agree. I feel like um, the, the Falcons secondary did a great job at containing players like Jarvis Landry, players like Michael Thomas, in the first three quarters, but, you know, like Tori said, they came alive in the fourth quarter. Um, Jameis Winston found them deep field, you know, in open pockets, and I feel like that's what really hurt the defense. Um, they kind of lost tempo late in the fourth quarter, and, you know, I feel like that is what really hurt them, you know. Um, but yeah, no, I would just say I think that's what, that's what really hurt them. You know, they started to – I don't know if the communication was lost between, you know, the linebackers or the secondary, but they just were all over the place. And, you know, once Jameis Winston found his rhythm, you know, it was it was a green light from there. Yeah, and I think that the Saints offense and the Falcons defense will kind of be analyzed for what happened in the fourth quarter. I look to what they were doing or maybe not doing offensively because the offense, a good running game, can be a real closer. Mm -hmm. And the Falcons' running game was pretty good to the tune of 200-plus rushing yards. Cordero Patterson was running very hard. Uh, Marcus Mariota was was moving um, with the football. There were a lot of good things to like. And with a couple minutes left, they really had an opportunity to just not give the Saints the ball back. And too often we saw Young Wei Koo, who is – who is as reliable as anyone, but he was kicking too many field goals. Too many long field goals, yes, too. Yes. You're talking two field goals that were well, – it was, what, 50 yards and then 54 yards? That's that's tough. Right. Because you, you, you want to be able to put more than three points on the board in those scenarios because sure. when you do get down to the fourth quarter and the Saints are coming back, you want more of a cushion. Right. And, look, everybody saw this game, and it, w- it was obviously not what the Falcons wanted to achieve here in the regular season opener. But there were a lot of good things that we saw. 
especially along the lines of scrimmage in the first three quarters. I mentioned the rushing yards. I was impressed not only with the total, but how they were able to run. Um, and when you look at this offense and how Arthur Smith ran it under Matt Ryan and how he's running it under Marcus Mariota, completely and totally different. Yep. And they were balanced, yeah. which is something that you don't often say about a Falcons team in recent seasons. So I to go off of that, I've been covering the Falcons since 2020. And every time that we saw a game like this or a loss, something that Matt Ryan said over and over and over again in his post-game press conferences was that the Falcons got too one-dimensional. Today, after the game, we heard Marcus Mariota say that we weren't one-dimensional as an offense. And I think that's the major thing that I take away from those first three quarters of what we saw this offense be they were not one-dimensional. And that's something that I have don't feel like I have been able to say about a Falcons team in a long time. And so if you're holding on to anything in terms of hope, in terms of progress, that is what I think you hold on to because that is something that I could not get out of my head. The fact that for so long we've heard being one-dimensional being an excuse as to why an offense wasn't working. You cannot use that as an excuse because they were not one-dimensional any longer. We saw so many different facets and so many different wrinkles of what the Falcons offense was able to do, just couldn't get it done in the fourth quarter. I, I think that, that Marcus uh, Mariota really kind of like was an example of how good things were and how things kind of also went south. Yeah. Because what do you look at? The, the way he was able to make tight window throws, the fact that he was doing RPOs, he was tucking the ball and, and, and keeping it. But they have a botched snap on like on a third down. He fumbles in the red zone, which is not something that you can do um, in this league. So you look at his performance, and I think that he kind of speaks to that, that he's a good e example of both that the Falcons did some it did some really good things, but also didn't do enough to win. And that's ultimately what happens. Uh, Ashton, when you look at this Falcons pass rush, right? They were getting after the ball. They created a turnover. Why do you think that they were able to be so um, impactful, especially with Grady Jarrett in the middle? Man, I think the communication was there. Um, Jarrett, of course, led the, the pass rush, but they were all on one accord. They all they all were buying in, and you saw um, Abby Katie, you saw Jarrett, you saw Michael Walker, you saw all of those guys like just firing at the ball, making sacks, making plays. And I think, like I said, there, just the communication was there between that that front line. Um, you can tell that they've been working on that over the course of training camp. That's been like a main focus for them. And you can tell that Grady, he's been adamant about, you know, just mentoring the young guys, getting them ready for the season. And we saw that today. It was on full display. We saw that in that front line. And something I'll add, for a team that only had 17 sacks in 2021 to come out in the first half and have four. Yeah. That is a stark difference from what we saw this team do, this defensive line do in all of 2021. And I, I really think that the difference was was they were getting after Jameis Winston in the first three quarters. They were getting him off of his spot. They were making him uncomfortable in the pocket consistently. In the fourth quarter, they speed up the tempo. Jameis Winston is able to hit a couple guys for 10, 15, 20 yards – starts getting the ball out of his hands a lot quicker, finds some open guys, that's the difference. You, if you're talking defensively, they weren't having the, they didn't have the time to get to Jameis Winston in the same way that they were in the first three quarters, in my opinion. And I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that Michael Thomas and Chris Olave were getting open really fast, yes. creating separation quickly. And it's crazy to say because A.J. Terrell doesn't make many mistakes ever. I, I don't know if he will say this is his best game or not, but it's something that really this Falcons team has to look back at this score. It is a – I mean, there's no bones about it. It's yeah. a like It's a difficult loss, but – what do you do from here? How do you make sure that one loss doesn't impact a second one? And I think the Falcons were really good at that last year in that you look at what happened to them against Washington here, and then they came back. They went to London and beat the Jets. They had a bye week, and then they went to Miami and beat the Dolphins. They were a resilient crew. I think that's a trademark of an, an Arthur Smith football team. Um, and they're going to have to turn the corner quickly. I, I talked to a bunch of different people in the uh, – in the open locker room period, Rashawn Evans, Jake Matthews, uh, Grady Jarrett from the, the podium, uh, Patterson, all kind of said the same thing. Don't let this define us. I thought Jake Matthews said something interesting in that he said, 
we don't need to course correct here. We don't need to make a big speech. Everybody understands how to work around here, how to keep moving forward. And it's not something that needs to be super dramatic. You just got to get back to work. And I know that even Grady Jarrett said kind of a boring answer, but it's exactly true. How quickly they, they move forward. If they can really do the old 24 hour rule, that's going to be key because the Rams are good yeah. and the Seahawks are far away and you never know what could happen up there. So they do need to, to turn the page quickly. I think, um, Ashton, you, you, you wrote a story on number eight overall NFL draft pick. Drake London had his NFL debut today. What did he say post game about what was really a pretty solid performance from the USA product? Yeah, man. I mean, he really, the gist of what he said was he has a lot to learn from. Um, he was really excited to be out there. You know, he missed the remainder of preseason. He was out for two to three weeks just in rehab and recovery, um, trying to get his knee back in place. Um, but the main things he's been focused on is, is just, you know, really learning how to run again. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and just m getting mentally prepared for this game. This is a big game. This is a big rivalry. And um, he showed and proved today. You know, he came out and did his thing. Um, he led all Falcons receivers. You know, he led the whole core with uh, 74 yards, and, and I think, you know, that is going to translate well uh, moving forward in the season. One thing I'll add, too, about that is when we were talking to Drake London post game, and this is the first time that we've talked to Drake London since before Detroit, before the game that he hurt his knee, he was very candid, which I was very surprised. I think for the last three weeks that we have not seen Drake London – I assumed that the knee was not really that big of an issue, and I assumed that his whole – like, they, that the Falcons were not playing him because it's the preseason. And you're like, okay, like, first play, first catch in Detroit, and he hurts his knee. Like, he's done. But the more we talked to him in post game after this game, I think I realized how, more, how significant the knee injury actually was, and I think I got more clarity on that because he told us after the game – Someone asked him, you know, if this same injury happens in the middle of the season, does it still take you three weeks to get back? And he said yes. And that was very surprising to me. So then I asked, I was like, what did the last three weeks actually look like for you? Like, how much were you actively able to do? And he said, he was like, I was just working back to running again. And then also rehabbing every single day. That was very shocking to me because I did not think that this injury was as significant as it was. Yeah. Um, and I think if, if, if he can get back to 100%, he's an, he, he's an explosive, impactful player. Yeah. yeah. He, he definitely this is. is. That's the thing is like, this may not have been 100% Drake London. Yes, I and agree. I, I, and that's something that like when I, when we were talking to him after the game, that was something that I really hung on to. It's like, okay, that's if that's not 100% Drake London, what does 100% Drake London look like? Right. Yeah, and I, I thought there were lots of encouraging signs. Look, the Falcons are going to be able to move the football. Yeah. They just will. It's just a matter of in close games, what they were so good at, 6-2 and two in one-score games last year, is not making that fatal mistake in the fourth quarter. Um, and they need to avoid that in the future. I'm – Obviously, nobody likes to start 0-1. I'm sure the Falcons don't, especially when they really had firm control over the course of three quarters. But I, I just go back and I look at it and I think this team has firepower. This team, if it can rush the passer with the talent in its secondary, they're going to win some football games. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how they do. Uh, moving forward here. So anyway, uh, that's going to do it for us. We're going to go ahead and uh, wrap it up right here, head home uh, on our respective drives away from Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Do what you always do. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and tune in next week for another exciting edition of Falcons Finalism. From L.A. Whoop, whoop.